You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Have I got a show for you today? Today we're talking about teenagers um, and some of the struggles that they face in dealing with alcohol and drugs and sex and all of the peer pressure related stuff that goes along with it, sprinkled in with a bit of anxiety and you know, everything that goes with being a modern day teenager with the internet and phones on cameras and all that newfangled business, they got to look out and we got to look out for them. So if you have teenagers or children of any age, this is relevant for you because at some point they're going to be teenagers. And as our guest today talks about, we need to start the conversation early. Um, I came away with this with loads of insights. So please continue listening and get your old notepad out. Before I get onto that, head on over to anxietypodcast.com. There's a variety of resources for you. You can get my free five-week course. There's other free stuff on there as well, as you may already know. Um, If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash anxiety podcast. I've had some new patrons recently help us out, and I really appreciate that. Um, Everything else on the site is fairly self-explanatory. If you want to join our Facebook group, you can do that too, um, and you'll see lots of options for other things you may want to dig into in a bit more detail. So let me introduce you to Dr. Michael Bradley, a very interesting chap with a a really interesting background. He grew up in Philadelphia, um, where, as he says, he barely survived his own adolescence. Um, And so, like, like many teens, his path to his passion found many detours. He was an officer in the U.S. Army, a disc jockey, a law school student before fate landed him in a job working with teenagers, um, a, a job he never dreamed he'd love. So that experience caused him to switch his studies to psychology and, uh, you know, on he went from there. Uh, he's at this point written a number of books uh, five or six books, I think, with a new one recently published. All of that information is in the show notes, so you can have a look at your own or in your own time after you've listened to the fantastic interview, of course. So, without further ado, let's chat to Michael. Here we go. Okay, so Dr. Michael Bradley, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I'm excited about today's conversation, um, specifically talking about teens and that kind of those formative years of when people are struggling with uh, figuring out who they are in this world. Um, so it'll be fun to fun to talk about that. But I would love to initially kind of hear a bit about your background and, and kind of how you got into doing the work you're doing today. Well, I, I ended up working with adolescents because I sort of was an adolescent for most of my life. I uh, couldn't figure out what I wanted to do in the world. I started out being a career army officer and said, boy, that's not me, and then decided to go to law school and found out that wasn't me and took a job working part-time in a juvenile prison of all places and just, you know, freaking loved it mm. and said, wow, this might be me, and uh, it turned out to be me. That's what I've been doing for 35 years now. Yeah. And you were in the army as well, was that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I, did that kind of give you some good uh, background in terms of um, working with people who are kind of struggling with different types of issues? Or Oh, oh absolutely. You know, first of all, the lesson that I pass on to the teens I work with is don't worry about making mistakes. Just be sure you do something. Don't do nothing. But mm-hmm. the military experience has been incredibly valuable because today when we look at kids who are struggling, families who are struggling, we use the military paradigm. We talk about a mission statement, strategies, and tactics. And it works really well in helping struggling families. Yeah, no doubt. And so why teens specifically as opposed to like adults? Why, why has that kind of become your the, the body of your work? Uh, teenagers are where the action is. It's just it's it's fascinating. It's very interesting. As long as they're not your own teenagers, it's mm. <laughs> terrific fun. Yeah. But uh, yeah. that's where the future human being is, is really being born. It's Everybody talks about the birth process and early childhood, and that's okay, but it's kind of boring. You know, when humans are very young, they're essentially smart puppies, nothing personal if you've got little ones out there. But 
it's when they hit the teen years that everything gets really fascinating because they can mm. suddenly think and they're asserting themselves. They're saying no and meaning it and they ask challenging questions. And this is the genesis of the future human being. So it's, it's fascinating work. And uh, in terms of sort of the evolution of the work, I'm really interested to find out how, what, what were teens showing up with as problems, you know, because you've been at this for a while, right? So how, how have you seen that line of work evolve over time? It's kind of gone from, if you look at the, the, the medical analogy, from a general practitioner to the emergency room. Because in the decades I've been working with teens, their issues have just accelerated in a, in sometimes a frightening way where their problems are much more profound, where they're dealing with stressors that teenagers were not just, they were not built by mother nature to handle. And uh, these days they're suffering at incredible numbers. It's not what I saw when I first got into the business. And so what's driving that? What's driving the suffering at a higher rate? It's, a, it's one of those perfect storm things, you know, a couple of factors. One, you know, all teenagers, uh, their brains don't work well. That's just the nature of what's going on where Mother Nature is scrambling the brain and reconstructing it to turn it into a, an adult brain. But getting there can be really chaotic. So for a period of time, they're, they're a little... Uh, we, we call them crazy. They, they don't make good decisions, uh, and teens admit that, too. They just have a hard time kind of navigating their way through things. That, that's been true since forever. What has changed is that the culture around our kids has become much more threatening, largely as a function of the electronics, um, where it's ended up producing these stressors, which in turn produce incredible rates of anxiety and depression in teens we never saw before. And um, the culture largely is to blame. And then the final factor is as interveners, as parents, as adults, trying to help out, we're, we're not doing things really well to help them handle these sorts of stressors. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've, I often reflect and think how grateful I am that the internet and cell phones with cameras and instant live streaming and all this stuff wasn't available when I was a teenager. I'm very grateful for that. Tim, you know? that is really important for adults to think about because a lot of us put these kids down. You know, they're lazy and they're, you know, drug preoccupied and sex preoccupied. And, um, and myself and my peers who work with teenagers, we sit around and, you know, talk about, you know, half of us would not be here. I'm convinced I would not have survived my own adolescence had I grown up today. Yeah, so interesting. I grew up in a small village in England in the middle of the countryside, and our entertainment was riding our bikes into town and trying to get our hands on some cheap alcohol and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it, we had to ride five miles to get there, so there was some adversity in the way, you know. Um, well, that's a, a great example of how things have changed, the five-mile factor. And, you know, myself as well, growing up, if, if we could steal a couple of beers without a father finding out because they used to count their <laughs> beers, nobody had any money. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that was my adolescence, which I thought was sort of gangsterish. Today, drugs are dealt in most homerooms in America. Mm. Uh, alcohol is just surrounding kids. Uh, and parents are really laid back about kids using drugs and alcohol. And in the States anyway, and possibly in Canada, we, we have a, an epidemic of drug addiction that has resulted because we got laid back with teenagers using large amounts of these things. Yeah, I mean, uh, you just made me think of like growing up in my dad's house. My dad wasn't a big drinker, and so his his uh, alcohol collection was almost like a museum. It was covered in dust and never touched. And so <laughs> stealing his booze was quite difficult because you'd have to take such minuscule amounts that he wouldn't notice. But I do fondly remember filling up a filling up a, a Coke bottle with uh, all these different ones and blending them together was the only way that I could make anything of any significance. And then I drank that and laid on the park bench feeling very 
ill and sorry for myself for a few hours so it didn't work out very well but there you go Under, understood yeah. today when you know kids we had to change the language in our questionnaires because <clears throat> when kids say we ask kids if they drink uh, it used to be that sort of behavior uh, when we first invented these tools that we use to assess the stuff today when kids say drink they run shots um, they mm. drink as much as they can, as fast as they can, to get their word, not to be offended by it, but to get retarded is their their goal. And they drink incredible amounts that, that are dangerous. Um, something else that has changed is the quantity of these things that kids use and have access to and the young age at which they start doing it. It gets younger and younger, which is a key part of the addiction problem. The younger somebody starts to use the stuff regularly in any significant quantity, the greater the odds of becoming a full-blown addict in, in short order. What's driving that, the difference between, you know, Tim in England drinking half a bottle of cider and stumbling around a bit to trying to get retarded? Like, where, what's, is that culture that's driven that excessive, like, high-octane behavior? Yeah, that brings you back to your observation about, thank God I didn't have the internet and cameras and so forth, because the kids are online now posting videos of themselves uh, completely drunk or stoned, um, stumbling around uh, in, in dangerous states, and they post it as red badges of courage sort of a thing. So it becomes a competition to see who can get crazier in my day of drug use, quote unquote, as a teenager, it was a couple of guys in the park in the cold, uh, you know, late at night. I wasn't in the comfort of my bedroom with, with enormous amounts of these drugs trying to compete with other kids to see who can get crazier. Right. Uh, out matching the, you know, 2000 YouTube videos from, uh, that, that you're looking at. So this has sort of thrown gasoline on the fire of normal teenage acting out back in the day. Yeah, uh, I have uh, fond memories of procuring a small amount of marijuana and walking for about three miles away from my house so I didn't get caught and then try and fumbling around trying to make a, a joint, which was uh, usually a bit of a mess and so it didn't really do very much. But yeah, very well, different to being acceptable at home to do it, you know? Right, and that, that tags the problem because a lot of us say, yeah, I did a little weed back in the day. What's the big deal? And the big deal is, one, uh, it wasn't available in the quantity that it is today. Two, it's much more potent these days than it was back in the day of my adolescence. It's three to nine times as potent. You right. know, think about taking a prescribed dose of laxatives like two pills versus taking six to 18 pills and you get an idea of relative impact of increased potency and because of that parents are like ah, i was just doing some weed so we have an astounding number of kids that are smoking an astounding amount of weed all the time and we now know that that lays the groundwork for full-blown addictions to things like heroin a few years down the road so that's an interesting point because, uh, in obviously in a, a number of states in America, uh, cannabis has been legalized. I think in British Columbia in Canada, where I am, it's going to be legalized in 2018. Uh, but already you can go into these dispensary type places and have some, uh, type of conversation with a doctor online or something and you can go in with an earache and they'll give you some. Uh, so how, how does that? Yeah. Does that kind of is it is it a gateway drug or is it just like alcohol and uh, it's a, it's another thing that that may lead to other things? But it, I don't know. It's it's interesting. That if does it open the door up to making drugs acceptable generally? Uh, yes. It, it, first of all, there's a huge distinction between adult use and teenage use. In adults, the research does not suggest that it's a gateway for the vast majority of users. In teenagers, it absolutely is a gateway to other drugs. Uh, adult brains are sort of hardened up, if you will. They've got very good defenses against addiction. Teen brains do not. They're very soft because of that brain development thing that goes on. So they're extremely vulnerable 
and they get whacked in specific neurologic ways by these drugs that adult brains do not suffer. For example, if somebody waits till they're age 21 to first begin using any neuroaddictive substance, that would be alcohol or marijuana or any of the other drugs, virtually everybody starts with alcohol or weed, um, the odds of them becoming an addict are about 1 in 25, which is relatively low risk. By the way, if they get to 25 before they use, it's almost unheard of that they become a, a full-blown addict. That those same odds at 14, if somebody is using uh, regularly, meaning once a week or more, uh, 17 of 25 kids who use regularly will become full-blown addicts. And when we look at the numbers, we look at 16 and 18 and 21, you can see the odds, the risk of addiction fall precipitously every year that they get through. So clearly, teenagers cannot use these substances. Yes, very, very interesting. And uh, for me, it kind of like, you know, alcohol has been around uh, seemingly in our lives forever. And in some cultures, like if you live in France, then you could have a small glass of wine with your family um, sat around the dinner table. But in some way, and again, this might just be my upbringing or my generation, but I feel like once you've destigmatized one drug, then for you to move from marijuana to, you know, ecstasy or something else may not be that big a leap anymore because it's just another drug. It's just slightly stronger or slightly different in the eyes of a teenager, right? That's exactly correct. And your other point about now that they're legalizing it, certainly decriminalizing it about everywhere, teenagers say, ah, see, that means it's harmless. Right. But the distinction between the adult brain and the teen brain has been lost in these discussions. Um, and it screws up the reward circuits in the teen brain. In other words, the weed and the alcohol give them tremendous relief from anxiety and depression. I know you're an expert on anxiety. Uh, and the stuff works. It'll make your anxiety go away for 40 minutes, an hour or so. But neurologically speaking, these are anxiety producers. They are uh, creators of depression as well because they screw up the teen brain's own reward circuits. And at some point, they stop working. The weed and the alcohol stops giving that payoff, that relief that teens seek. And that's when moving up to ecstasy or try some cocaine or the biggie in the States is, hey, I got a pain pill here. Try this. And that, of course, takes them right to heroin. So the pain pill being like opioids leads to uh, heroin potentially? Absolutely. Pain, most of these pain pills are opioids. They're, they're all using this, the same essential molecular chain as heroin. Um, the pain pills now are very hard to get a hold of. They're very expensive. And heroin is dirt cheap. So that's why we have this explosion in uh, heroin addiction here in the States. Right. You have kids, Mike, right? Yes, sir. How old are your kids now? 26 and 19. So um, rewind to you're obviously in this practice and already doing this work. So when your kids were teenagers, um, let's say they came to you and said the people at school are, are smoking weed. Uh, what should I do, Dad? Like, how do you how, how did you handle that with them? Actually, I started the conversation on the way home from the hospital after the delivery. And that's what we encourage parents to do, is to start talking about the parental value about drugs and alcohol. Um, it turns out that the, the safest thing we can do for kids is, as silly as it sounds, is to tell them that is, it is our expectation they will not do these drugs until they're 21. Right. Um, it's not a police state. It's not putting them up against the wall and searching their rooms and so forth. If you have a problem with a kid doing drugs, you may have to do that down the road. But for starters, you just say, I love you. I'm smarter and older than you. I've seen a few things, and I'm telling you, it's my expectation that you will not use. And I remember Ross, my son, you know, would, would laugh at that. And I would say, I know, it's kind of funny. Everybody, you know, uses, and, you know, a lot of the parents use with their kids, by the way, and that's true. And I say, I get it, but I'm just telling you, son, we have 
addiction in the family, which we do genetically in our ancestry. And I said, it's dangerous. And I'm telling you, that's my expectation. And I'll do everything I can to try to keep you from using because I love you. When he went to college, you know, we had the discussion and he laughed and he said, dad, you really think I'm not going to drink in college, right? And I said, son, I'm not predicting. I'm just telling you, I love you. It is my expectation. You will not use. When you turn 21, I'd love to take you out for your quote first beer. And he laughed really hard at that. And I said, until then, it's my expectation you won't use. Ross, in fact, who's a heavy metal musician, they actually pay him money to make that noise, um, <laughs> actually called us up and said, I have to commute to school. I can't stay in the dorms because they're so drug infested. When we say drugs, we mean alcohol as well. He said, it's so out of control. I, I just, I can't live here anymore. Now, I know he was using to some extent, but it, the research bore out what happened with Ross, which is giving them that expectation and having that loving discussion uh, turns out to limit their behavior. It doesn't mean they're never going to use. Of course they will. But it, it limits it. They tend to be less into you know, drinking themselves into oblivion um, as long as it's a love-based communication from the parent. That is our most effective strategy. So you're creating some early foundations for for a consciousness or awareness of their situation backed by you and not in a forceful policing way as you said not in you will never drink but saying like it's i like the language like it's my expectation um is yeah. is is concrete but it's not like you know not pushing them up against a wall as you said it's uh it's you know a gentle way of saying kind of what you expect from them which i think is is a good way to do it Exactly. I mean, Ross has since, now that he's a full-blown adult, you know, he's he's told me, you know, Dad, you really ruined the drinking parties for me because I always felt guilty. And I loved that because, <laughs> you know, guilt, it turns out, is a, a healthy emotion. It, it helps us think about, well, you know, are we doing a smart thing here or not? So that's sort of what it is. Now, a lot of parents, you know, they the, the ones that are trying to help their kids not get drug involved are looking for an absolute guarantee and that takes us down the path of fear-based measures of you know unnecessary drug testing and searching the bags that creates you know a prison mentality and that only fosters the kids inclination to use drugs as a form of rebellion like you can't tell me what to do so it you know the research is overwhelmingly clear you know, love your kid, tell them that, and tell them this is what you expect. And so just to clarify, you, start, you started having that conversation when they were what age, like old enough to speak? Exactly. You, you look for, it's not one marathon talk, it's 10,000 mini talks. You know, it's, you know, the kid says, yeah, something was wrong with, with Mr. Jones. He was, you know, and maybe your kid's eight years old. He was drinking beers all day and was slurring his speech and staggering around. He said to the kid, oh, what did he look like? What did that seem to be to you? Uh, how did Mr. Jones' children react to that? What was his wife doing? So you, you just start awareness sorts of questions. By the way, questions are much more powerful than answers. Right. And as soon as the kid gets annoyed and says, you know, well, I think it's fine to drink. You say, oh, okay, what, what would you like for lunch? You, you finish, you sign off. You don't get into a football game with a kid on these things. You just throw out observations, opinions, expectations. Saying less is saying more when it comes to these interactions. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's a, a great way to, to kind of guide them. So, and you put, and you're sort of lumping alcohol and drugs into the same conversation. And so what you're saying, Mike, is you never saw your kids drink until they were over 21? Correct. Right. Yeah. Because of those, all those little micro conversations added up to kind of build that consciousness in them. Right. And, you know, if you know, one time we, we did find um, with our daughter that, you know, kids had snuck alcohol into the party in the basement and um, it, <laughs> my, my wife actually caught on to it, you know, because the kids would always be at our house. Another trick of raising teenagers is make your house a hangout house. So you keep an eye on them. 
And uh, Friday night, she said, what's wrong with this picture as the kids are going by? And I said, I, I don't see anything. She's another adolescent expert. She said, "Who? what kid carries a backpack on a Friday night? So sure enough, you know, I went downstairs to surprise them with the pizza and there were the alcohol bottles. And so we said, sorry, guys, we got a call tonight. But, you know, the, the price we're going to pay first before we get to the pizza is just need to tell you, you know, alcohol is a drug. This is, you know, this stuff kills 5,000 kids a year in, in the States. You know, I'm sorry to wreck your party, but we're also calling up the parents. And we're not saying who brought what. We're not cops. We're just saying we had a situation. Kids are bringing in liquor and just thought you should know. And my daughter hated that stuff. Just absolutely went insane, ruining her social life. And then actually a couple of months ago, she said, um, cause she, she had a, she lost a friend to drugs and she said, thank you for doing what you guys did. That's amazing. Yeah. That's the, the, they appreciate it in the long run. Just at oh, the time it might be painful. <laughs> oh, they hate you in the moment, <laughs> but that's part of being a parent is loving your kid enough to be hated at times. Do you ever, did you ever get into the science behind it with them? Uh, such as, you know, the reason that it, we wait is because the brain is still in formation. There's still some, you know, still plastic. So we have to wait till that firms up before it makes sense and, and right. you can kind of handle it. Right. But again, you can't, you know, lectures don't work. They just bounce off of them. So right. you, you know, like a judo sort of a thing, you wait for an opening. So I would always bait them, you know, in a conversation with the kids about drugs saying, you know, who here thinks it's okay in this group for, for teenagers to drink? And more than half the kids would raise their hands. I said, well, tell me why it's okay. So they'd say things like, well, adults drink all the time, and, you know, it doesn't hurt them mostly. And I'd say, oh, it's interesting you say that. So now the opening is there. You've sort of trapped them because they raised that particular point. You can say, did you guys know that teen brains and adult brains are very different? And so then you can begin that discussion. You can talk about, you know, uh, is it okay for a pregnant woman to drink? And they'll say, no, you know, it creates fetal alcohol syndrome because they've had the classes in school. I'll say, right, do you know why that is? Mm, no, well, it's because that, that brain and that developing baby has grown and it's very vulnerable because it's grown. Just like your brains, guys, they start this amazing growth in early adolescence and it doesn't finish up. Most of it to like 18, 19, 20. Mm. Actually, it doesn't fully finish till 25. And they're stunned to hear this stuff. But you have to time it so it's relevant. You have to trick the kid into asking the question or making a statement. And then you can say things like, okay, show me your research. You know, love to compare research that says it's okay for teenagers to do these drugs and I'll get my research and let's go out to the coffee shop and chat about what we found. Now, what if a parent's listening to this and saying, but I did drink alcohol when I was 15, so how do I, do I tell the truth to my kids and say that was a mistake, or do I focus on, you know, their well-being moving forward? Yeah, just to, before I answer, uh, I have a lot of experts I admire that hate it when I say this and disagree with me, but my motto is to tell the truth. Um, first of all, make it age-appropriate. You know, if, if a kid is asking at a young age, you, you may want to say, ask me, you know, when you're 10 or 14 or whatever. Um, so punt, but don't lie. Uh, when they ask, see, now again, that window is open in their brain. So take them out to the coffee shop. Coffee shops work great, by the way. Teenagers feel very adult there, and they'll talk differently than in the kitchen. So you run them out to the coffee shop. So I'm glad you asked the question. Yes, I did drink. And... This is what happened to me, and I, I personally drank way too much in college. It almost got me, and I had to go through a, a period of sobriety to fight what I felt was addiction creeping into me because we have the genetic tendency. So I'll tell them the story, and they're you know they see me as kind of you know competent and relatively strong, and you know used to be a tough guy back in the day. And I said, yeah, you know, I was a tough guy back in the day in the military, and. That's when it almost took me out. It's not about being strong. It's all about how the brain reacts to this stuff. Um, 
And since you asked the question, you know, t- you tell the full truth. Say, can I also tell you about, you know, a friend of mine who's no longer here. He died from drug use or, uh, you know, drinking and driving. So you now tell them the realities of this stuff. And if the kid says, well, you know, you drank and you're okay, so I can drink, then you use the roller coaster analogy. Um, because the, the fact of the matter is if you go over all the statistics, if a teenager starts to use, their averaged out risk of addiction is about 10%, about 1 in 10, although the Surgeon General now says it's about 1 in 7. But in any event, my numbers say 1 in 10. So I say to the kid, do you like roller coasters? Say, yeah, I love roller coasters. If you were going to get on one and you saw a sign that says caution, every 10th kid who rides this ride loses their life. Would you get on? I said, no, that would be crazy. Yeah, well, that's exactly what you're doing by drinking in the park every weekend. That's exactly what you're gambling with. Yeah, slightly different when you put it that way. You, you, you have mentioned to make that... it real. Sorry, I'm go on. sorry. No, go ahead. I just you try to always make things real. If you talk about long-term vague concepts of the downside of drug use, it doesn't work. You have to bring it back into terms, short-term sorts of things. Using those metaphors or those numbers can, can work very well. And the other thing I wanted to, to, to pick up on was you said at the start, this may be contentious amongst other professionals in your field. So what would they recommend? What's the alternative? To lie? Yeah, they, they say to lie, which I think is a disaster. Uh, they say, no, it gives permission to kids to use, you know, that line that I used where the kid might say, well, you're fine, so I can drink, I can use weed. Uh, I, I, my cardinal rule with kids is never lie. You can punt, you can just say, eh, it's really none of your business or I'll tell you when you're older. But once you lie, you, you lose the trust, uh, which is so important in a parenting relationship. So I think it's better off to tell the painful truth on any of those subjects, sex or drugs or, you know, acting out behaviors, um, and to preserve that relationship. And also, if you do say, yeah, I never drank as a teenager, you know, Mother Nature has this karma sense where suddenly your brother-in-law shows up and says, oh, he told you he never drank? Oh, man, we used to pour him on his front porch on friday nights he was so trashed all the time <laughs> and then your kid looks at you like oh, okay right dad it's kind of the problem we have with trump in the states you know who the hell believes anything he says so not to get political on you but it's once you lose that credibility you lose any power to influence because people just laugh when you talk yeah and so um you mentioned sex there so moving on to sex is that is that something which is handled in a similar way, or what, how do you start the conversation around that? Yeah, same, same. And you know, you start with expectation that the that the risks are different, but you, you do talk about the risks, and you look for you know the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult to anticipate this. Often, it's after excuse me, that you found out your kid is sexually active, but you need to talk with them about, you know, well, what are the potential downsides? And it's amazing how much sex ed they go through and how little they know. Uh, and that's that lecture effect where they don't really care and they're not assimilating information. Um, for example, kids are having unprotected sex at an incredible rate again since the AIDS scare diminished a tad and our sexually transmitted diseases have exploded. Um, the, another is they don't think you can get STDs from oral sex. That's part of their mythology, even though their classroom syllabus said otherwise. Um, the, the biggest part is the emotional aspects of sex. That you know, Their culture tells them it's a party activity, and it's you know, simply to have fun. But kids are then stunned to find out how emotional it can be for them, including the boys, interestingly. Um, boys don't like to talk about it, but often you know, they feel funny using 
girls when they see that the girls tend to be more emotional about sex. And it's another stressor because they're so much more sexually active than prior generations. And now they're trying to deal with these the, the stresses of sexual activity, which adults have a difficult time doing. Yeah. And they're not built to handle that level of stress. The girls are becoming sexual before they even have sexual values um, because their culture tells them to sort of function like boys, but they're just not hardwired to do that. And it's another source of the anxiety and depression. And even suicide that we're seeing, suicide has also exploded in our culture over the past five decades among teenagers. So the conversation around sex is a, is a similar one, which is kind of beginning the expectation. Would you use the similar type of language around that? I think so. And also saying, just to let you know, you know if you take a look at the research, since you've asked if it's okay to have sex with your boyfriend slash girlfriend, say, you know, it's coffee shop time. And, you know, most of the girls uh, uh, regret their first sexual encounter. Uh, most girls feel that they're supposed to do it versus really feeling uh, love, affiliation, connection. Most females, even in this modern culture, still associate sex with emotional feelings, powerful feelings, such as cherishing future planning and exclusivity. Say so boys are not wired that way. Um, girls seem to be, even the ones that say they're not. So it's much more complicated than just having sex. So with the girls, they need to be armed in advance that it can be very complex for them emotionally. And do you need an additional stressor? You need to think about this. With the boys, an interesting, because the boys don't suffer emotionally with sexual activity. To most of them, it's just a, a party. But a, a good thing to say is, you know, girls are wired differently. Most of them are very emotionally involved in sexual activity. Said, son, I have a question. I don't want you to answer. I'd like you to think about, are you willing to potentially hurt a friend of yours just to have some sex? Please think about it. So, again, it's lobbying questions, um, you know, not demanding answers, certainly not arguing answers, but just kind of helping them understand there's more to it than the culture suggests to them. But the culture just pounds them to be sexual at incredibly early ages. Which, again, is exacerbated by the uh, the rise of online videos and peer groups and all that kind of stuff, I imagine. Absolutely. Just, and, and, you know, all the media, uh, the, the songs, the videos and so forth, all are portraying sex as a party activity. Um, it, it, it goes in a circle, by the way. It's another aspect of that perfect storm because they're not prepared to handle the stressors of that. And, you know, the book I just released, I wrote one of the stories about this boy who was 13, who had sex with a girl. And this boy was, you know, the conversation before I identified his age would be of, of a young adult talking about, you know, that he had sex with a girl he doesn't really care about, and she's head over heels in love with him, and she can't live without him, and she's going to kill herself if, you know, he is with somebody else. And this is a 13-year-old boy who was sitting there wringing his hands about what do I do, you know, how do I get out of this without her dying? At 13, are you kidding me? You know, so that makes the drugs look really appealing. Who would not want to get stoned or drunk trying to deal with that thing at 13? So that's how I go back to this observation about the perfect storm that is causing this suffering. So let's... Uh hypothesize for a minute that, that these conversations weren't had in advance. And so you, somebody comes to you with a 13 or 14 year old individual who's already got into the sex and or drugs. Um, where do you, where does the education go from that, from that stage? Well, the, first of all, as parents, uh, we typically are not in a good state to parent when we first learn that our kid is sexually active, particularly if it's our daughter. Um, the double standard still exists very powerfully. 
but regardless of the, the gender of the child who's active, the first question, once the parent has calmed themselves down, is to say to the kid, okay, what did you learn? It's a key question. Because the kid, when it's discovered that they're sexually active, and usually it's, you know, some, somebody ratted them out or they found a text or whatever, the kid's waiting to be grounded, they're waiting to be yelled at, they're waiting to be judged. And you really let them off the hook if what you do is scream and yell, call them names and ground them, because they're not going to learn anything. And that's where we have to revise our mission statement. Back in the day, parents thought their mission was to control kids. Our mission today has to be teach them to control themselves because the culture is so much more powerful. They have to make these decisions. There's no way they won't be confronted with a decision. You can't control a kid out of these situations. Rather, you have to arm them as best you can to navigate these situations. So a great question after they mess up, whether it's sex or drugs or vandalism or whatever, is to wait till the light of day, don't have these discussions at 2 in the morning, they don't work out well, just say we'll talk tomorrow. And the next day after you've had your coffee and deep breathing, you say to your kid, tell me what you learned. And the kids are stunned by that question. So what are you talking about? Tell me what you learned. Think for a moment. What did you learn in this activity of sex or drugs or whatever? And then often you will hear the things you want to hear. You know, you'll hear things like, well, it wasn't what I thought. It wasn't as great as I thought. Or, you know, I, I had these worries or, I, you know, we didn't use protection and now I'm scared. And so that opens the window again to the reality of sex and drugs and violence or whatever you're dealing with by simply asking them questions. If they blow you off or get sarcastic, then you just say, okay, I'll tell you what, you know, let's talk later tonight. Um, so, you know, never get into a, a, you know, a wrestling match on these things because the gold is what's going on inside their heads. Much of parenting through these things I call guerrilla warfare, another military metaphor to, that, you know, it's not huge battles. It's not Gettysburg. It's more you run up to your opponent's wall and you lob a hand grenade over and you run the hell away. Um, parents need to use a similar strategy where you lob in questions, observations, expectations, short, sweet, and then you kind of run the hell away, uh, particularly when the kid says something sarcastic because you let it kind of bounce around in their brain. They will think about it if you don't turn it into a football match. If you don't start yelling or judging or, you know, come back here and we're going to have this talk, you just let the kid walk and say, look, I can see it's upsetting. We'll talk later. You can't make any ground. You can't teach at all with an upset brain. It has to be relatively calm. Because they're in defensive mode, I suppose, at that point. Absolutely. They're in what we call the child brain in the back of their head, fight or flight, Um and they're not really thinking, and you have to calm that brain and try to get to the front of their head, the prefrontal cortex. That's what we call the adult brain. That's the smart brain. That's where real learning occurs. But when they're defending themselves or, you know, trying to uh, you know, handle a, a drubbing, a screaming match, the front brain is shut down entirely. They're totally in the back of the head. Yeah. One something you wrote, kind of moving on to the the anxious side, but you wrote in in forty years of clinical practice with teens, you found you found anxiety to be the root of most adolescent challenges. So, can you expand a bit on that for us? Yeah, anxiety um, is you know, and again, you, you're the expert at this. You've personally experienced it from what I've read. Um, it, it's crippling. It can be all consuming and it really lights up that back brain, the child brain. That's really what's going on. The child brain feels that as a, as a threat to life and well-being. And, uh, it sets off a whole biochemical chain of events that it really wears people down. It's, it's an awful existence for adults. For teenagers, it's exponentially more awful. Uh, they don't have the maturity to be able to, to deal through these things. 
Uh, they have a hard time understanding the sun will come up tomorrow. Um, they see things in black and white. They tend to catastrophize things. Um, so it, it has a much more profound effect. As, as painful it is, as it is for an adult, it's much worse for a teenager. And that, again, can set off a chain of events of drugs and sex and acting out behaviors to try to cope with anxiety uh, as opposed to being able to learn to tolerate it, to be able to manage it. Um, and uh, and that's why we're losing so many kids. It's part of the equation of suicide. They're just they're tired of living like that. And we haven't really alerted them to the fact that there's things you can do to manage anxiety. Uh, they just think this is the way it is, and the way it is is not a way I choose to exist. And that's why we have record numbers of suicides. Yeah, and I feel like my experience uh, in that, in the newest kind of uh, generation of teenagers, because of the online aspect and because of that instant gratification, the, you know, seeing results as quickly as possible, uh, it's very difficult for them to sit with discomfort and process it. They kind of, it's like, I need something now. And if I can't have something now, I'm going to try something else. And, and, and obviously that will go from, if I can't get something which is going to numb the pain, I'll go and find something, uh, another solution, whether that be drugs or alcohol or something else to try and fix it. That's exactly correct. And the reason is, in addition to just life maturity, we now know that the teen brain experiences everything in more powerful ways than do adult brains. Um, ice cream will never taste as good to you as an adult as it did at age 13. The same, unfortunately, is true with sex and with drugs. The same is, and that's how they can get addicted to those things. And the same is also true with negative emotions, such as anxiety and depression. They actually experience these things in exponentially more powerful ways than do adults. And part of the problem is when our child, a teenager, comes to a parent very often and says, oh, I feel depressed or anxious, the parent will dismiss that. What do you have to feel depressed about? What do you mean you're anxious? You know, I pay all your bills and all you have to do is go to school and, you know, play your sport. And so we become dismissive. But we forget two critical things. One, the world that our kids is growing up in is very different than the world we grew up in. And second, they are just not equipped to deal with these things because they're experiencing, they're experiencing the negative emotions so much more powerfully than adults do. So when a teenager is clinically depressed, <clears throat> when we equate their description to the adult description, it would be the difference between an adult saying, yeah, you know, I just feel crummy a lot of the time, um, to the adult saying, I can't get out of bed in the morning. So in other words, the same set of stressors for a teenager can be crippling and as opposed to the adult. And we have to sort of adjust our parameters to more effectively deal with teenagers as opposed to dismissing them saying, you know, what do you have to feel anxious about? Right. And I suppose the other question I have for you is, and, and I'm, I'm sure this must happen a lot because a lot of people wait till things are in crisis mode before they do anything. The proactive approach of parenting, as you said, um, is something that you've, you've been lucky to demonstrate as a result of your work. But if somebody's, if somebody feels like they've lost their teen, as in they're into whatever they're into and they don't listen to them anymore and the doors get slammed and, how, what's the next step there if you don't feel like you've got a line of communication and there isn't a, a chance to take him to the coffee shop and sit him down and say, how did that feel for you? Uh, you uh, first of all, uh, don't quit the game. Uh, when you're in those phases is actually when your kid needs you more than ever before. Um, and second, don't take it personally. Uh, a lot of parents feel rejected and they go through you know, a, a actual parental grief they feel the loss of their child. Uh, they're, they're gone, they're done. This parenting game is over, and I don't like them, and they don't like me. It, it, it's actually the inverse. When, when a kid becomes angry and cuts off, that, that those are flares in the sky saying, help, help, help. So the parent has to adjust their style, and that's where you beg, borrow, and steal for time with the kid. 
when my son and I went through those dark days, you know, he just uh, refused to have anything to do with me. We call it the massive stroke. Like one day you're kind of interesting and funny and smart, maybe even athletic, and the next day the kid turns 13 and you've lost it all overnight. You had a yeah. huge stroke and nobody told you. Um, and so you have to just shake that off and say, okay, we're just entering a new phase here. Well, Ross would just, you know, couldn't believe I was his father. Just, you know, I was the dumbest thing since sliced white bread. And I literally finally, you know, after asking a number of times, I made a white flag and waved it in the computer room where he always was. And I said, hey, how about if you and I go get a coffee? And he said, uh, you mean you and me outside? And I said, yeah. He said, no. And I said, why? And he said, somebody might see me there with you. So you sidestep that stuff. Say, Ross, tell you what. I'll give you five bucks to get a coffee with me. And he looked at me and he said, five bucks? I said, yeah. He said, cash? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he said, up front? I said, yeah, you get the five. And, you know, you can say whatever you want. I'm not taking it back. And back then the movie was out, show me the money. He says, show me the money. So I gave him the five. And he's like grinning and showing off the, the, the dollar, the $5 bill to the family like he got over on me. Ten minutes later, he was like, nonstop chatting at the coffee shop. I don't know why that happened. I think it's that we get locked into roles of power and control, and he had to establish, I'm not all that, and he's his own person or whatever. So giving him the five, taking a concession, gave him what he needed, and suddenly we were reconnected. So you have to just try a bunch of different things. I had a mom... <laughs> tell me that her daughter wouldn't talk to her for a week and it was breaking mom's heart and mom said I, i'm sure this was the wrong thing to do um and then she told me she filled two water pistols on a silver platter and took them into her daughter's room and her daughter was saying get out of here mom you're stupid you're psycho and mom said choose your weapon and the daughter said you know, you're crazy. And mom said, okay, and start to shoot her daughter with a water pistol. <laughs> and the daughter started screaming and picked up the other water pistol. And the next thing you know, they're chasing their, each other around the house, soaking each other, yelling and laughing and remembering that they love each other. So you just have to get creative and also be like the good salesperson. You know, you just don't take no for an answer in a polite way. Uh, you keep coming back and knocking on the door and say, I got a hug for you. Get away from me. I, it's perverted. You don't hug me. You say, all right, son, I get that. But let me know. The hug's always here. And you don't quit. The kids tell me how sad and lost they feel when the parents quit. Um, even when the kid is saying, you're stupid, get away from me, it's very centering for the kid to know the parent is still out there whenever they need them. Yeah, they tell you to go away, but they actually want you to keep trying. Exactly. And the parent has to be big enough to understand that and then shake off that frustration. And remember what it was like for us to be teenagers. We were essentially the same in that way. We were not nice people to our parents at times. Sometimes we were too afraid to show them what we felt, but we essentially had the same need to break away from parents. And that's okay. That's part of nature's plan. Yeah, I always I always tell anybody who listen, but I was I was I'm um, I'm sure bad to my mum and dad in my teenage years, and then when I left home and came back again in my early twenties, I was like, "Wow, you're really nice. I love coming here. Like, you're, you're nice Mark people." Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain said it best. He said, "When I was sixteen, I couldn't believe how stupid my father was, and when I turned twenty-one, I couldn't imagine how did he learn all that in only five years." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And I think sometimes, as you said, sometimes it's just being persistent and realizing that time alone is is uh, going to take care of a lot of things if you can kind of keep them safe and keep them uh, keep them on the right track, you know. And that's what parents have to say to ourselves is a lot of this is playing for time because Mother Nature continues to wire that brain. That's the great miracle. And so you don't get despondent. You just keep saying, you know, one of our mantras was alive at 25. People are horrified to hear a parenting expert saying that's all we <laughs> focused on with our own children. But it was true. It was like, you know, if we get them, you know, to 
to 21 without being addicts or, you know, a parent unexpectedly or have a prison record, Mother Nature will take care of the rest. They do calm down. They can think better. They become more motivated. They want to do things in the world. And they don't think you're so stupid anymore as a parent. I remember when Ross actually asked me an opinion on something. I, I said, you know, hold, hold that moment. I said, I, I gotta, I gotta call your mom. And I called up Cindy. I said, you're not gonna believe this. Ross asked my opinion on something because I think he was like 20 at that point. And she laughed because we we knew the joke. So for parents, it's an important message. Don't get despondent. When you're out in a small boat in the middle of the storm in the middle of the night, it's real scary, but the sun does come up. And that's what happens with teenagers. They become almost always great young adults. If you just don't panic and, you know, do a few basic things, you'll get through it. Well, Mike, I've loved our conversation today. Uh, we've covered loads of great stuff. If parents wanted to kind of get more resources on this in terms of, having some stuff in their armory statistics or information, where's a good place for them to find it? Well, the Internet is full of wonderful resources. There's lots of parenting centers. Um, I would just do a Google search on parent education, um, and, and people put together great libraries of stuff. There's a particular program called Kids in the House, K-I-T-H, which they got about every expert in the world to do a series of short videos on these questions. It was a fantastic idea. I'm mad I didn't think of it first. And you can punch up an expert and a particular question and look at some short videos. Uh, a great quick and easy uh, resource. And how can people find you if they wanted to look up more about what you do? Uh, my website is uh, docmikebradley.com, D O C M I K E B R A D L E Y.com. And they can shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat with people and move them on to other resources as they need. Perfect. Well, listen, thank you, Mike. I've, I've learned a lot myself. I'll be re-listening to this and, uh, making some more notes because I have an 11 year old and a nine year old and, uh, yeah, it's time to start having these conversations. <laughs> Buckle your seatbelt, get ready for the adventure. It's, I know, it's I think it's one. already started, actually. The adventure's already started. So uh, <laughs> uh, in, in terms of them not listening to me, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. a good sign. You're doing your job well. Yeah, exactly. All right, my friend. Well, thanks very much for coming on. Much appreciated. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tim. Take care. Cheers, bye. There you have it. Dr. Michael Bradley, uh, loads of great insight from that. I think one of the big things is kind of just pacing the conversation with kids in terms of not always going for it in the moment, but maybe parking it and saying, let's talk about this in the morning, taking them out of the potentially combative environment being the home and taking them to a neutral ground being the coffee shop or whatever, that type of thing. Again, very sage advice, and I think that's going to pay dividends in my future anyway. Um, if you enjoyed today's show and you would like to leave us a beautiful review, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You're a lovely person. Um, go to iTunes, Stitcher wherever you consume this noise and leave a lovely review and uh, I'll be eternally grateful. If you have anything you'd like me to cover on the podcast or any people you think I should talk to on the podcast, go to the contact page, send me an email and I will see what I can do for you. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, Go to theanxietypodcast.com.